know that your budget tells your story. So I also review budgets and um, not budgets. I review <coughs> grants for certain um, foundations. Some of my friends, um, and we start. Some of us start with the budget because it's a lot of work to read through 30 pages, and then you get to the budget and none of the numbers add up. So some of us work in reverse, and we start with the budget and the budget narrative, and then we work our way back. Or we'll read the whole thing, and then we won't remember what you said on page 5, because we're on page 60. So your budget and the budget narrative should be really, really detailed and tell a really interesting story about what you're doing and why you need funding. Um, different funders have different formats. I gave you guys those budgets to look at. That's from the Omaha Community Foundation. They'll give you those. These are the categories. I'm sliding through right now. These are the categories. Can I just stop you? Yes. Do you have like an example of a, of a very successful budget narrative that you can maybe send us later? Because I'm curious mm -hmm. to see what that looks like. I can send you, yeah, I'll send you uh, one of the federal. So the federal budget narratives <coughs> are way more complex, but those are the best ones to kind of use when you're telling other stories. So mm -hmm. I can send that to you. That'd be you. awesome. Thank yeah. And just know, so when I write grants, I don't do budgets. I do the grant narrative and the budget narrative um, because I don't want to be responsible for someone else's budget. Yeah, right. Yes, ma'am. Are <laughs> <laughs> y'all team, right? <laughs> okay, so other types of budgets. So program budgets are, they need to, your program budget needs to be reflected on your um, organizational budget. Um, Sal and I had a few conversations about Education Box because our budget isn't really reflective of everything that we do. Um, but it always should be, regardless of your emotional feeling about how someone will feel about looking at your budget. Everything that you spend, everything that comes in, needs to be reflected on those budgets. Summary budgets, these are my favorites. Uh, so with federal grants, um, they don't do as much with the summary budgets. Um, it's more so foundations. The summary budget is where you're going to give a narrative about the budget, about the money that you need, about the money that you're spending, etc. Capital campaigns are tricky. You can apply for capital campaigns, but you want to be careful because there are lots of restrictions on those. Um, like you can't, one of them is like you have to, not always, but usually you have to go and get bids from a diverse group of subcontractors doing the construction work. Um, sometimes it's just it's just really tricky. So make sure that you're there, like you're reading through all of these grant um, RFPs thoroughly before you're you Is a capital campaign uh, only for buildings? Well, it's it's for lots of things. So it's infrastructure type, like it's buildings. It could be like our boundary. So I wrote a, like a capital campaign, but it was basically to <laughs> put, put a parking lot into. Uh, a the, building. So it's yeah. a physical thing. Yeah, it's a it's yeah brick and mortar, yeah. brick and mortar, um, which was interesting. I wrote a grant for permeable papers. I didn't even know what that was, but it was funny. <laughs> so it <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right, we're doing this. But, okay. Um, consultants are like really big. So I really believe that any nonprofit, if you are small, or even if you just want to be super efficient, you should use consultants. Um, it's cheaper for you in the long run because you're not paying for all the things that you would have to pay for with a regular employee. Um, so consultants are evaluators and trainers, consultants, people like me, who write grants and can do executive coaching. Um, just if you can, always try to make sure you're efficient when you're spending money. So if you can get a consultant over hiring a staff member, do that, because then you can put that money towards actual program or actually the staff that you really, really need. Yes. When you hire a grant, not hire a grant writer, contract a grant writer, are they paid based on the percentage of the grant that they write? Or well. How is that? <laughs> <laughs> so this is funny. So I, I have a rate, and I like either you pay a rate or you don't pay a rate. Um, I have some people who are just near and dear to my heart, so I give them a drastic discount, and they um, give me an in kind donation uh, receipt. At the end of the year, which helps me with my taxes. I've had people approach me, um, like the school district, and they're like, well, we have this specific program that we can't get funded through grant writing. Can you write this grant? We can't pay you right now. I'm like, okay, you can pay me after you get it, because I know they're going to get it. And I'm like, this is what I'll charge you after. I've had a newspaper that I've written grants for, but the nonprofit side. Um, and their board wasn't really sure they didn't want to pay my rate. And I'm like, you really, really want to pay the rate. And they're like, no, we don't know if we can afford this. And I'm like, okay. I'm 
like, I'll give you a reduced rate, but then you have to give me a percentage of the money that I bring in. Which, they got mad when you have the right to check. I'm like, I told you to pay the rate. Like, you chose this. Um, so there's various ways that you can do it. I'm like, you made that decision. Um, there's various ways that you can do it if you're grant writing. The easiest way for me, I typically just give people my rate. Um, I'm the person I was working with that I got the UN grant for, I'm not working with him anymore. Um, he, he said, can you write this grant for me? It's due next week. And I'm like, no. Um, but just because it's culturally it's different. Um, and I just, I don't like that pressure. And it's, like he's, he's fine. I gave him the materials. He can copy and paste everything that I've written. Um, but basically you want to have a rate and just use that same rate. Can you write that expense into the budget of the grant? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, you can list it as consultant. Yes. So this is something. Um, what about some costs that are like maybe not direct? So you have grant writing, but something like marketing consulting. Because like we were talking earlier about how social media yeah. and all this. And what if your organization is so tiny, doesn't have a marketing person, and that supports your programming? Like how it's kind of like weird costs that. Um, that's included in here too. But you do want it. So with marketing costs. Um, for me, a lot of that is program driven, mm -hmm. so it depends on how you're using that marketing as to where you're going to put it on your budget, but put everything on your budget. Um, you can contract out for marketing mm -hmm. and assign it to the program. But it's, so it's okay to include things like that in your It's okay grants. to include it, but you just literally have to, when you're, if you're trying to do a grant or something, you want to be really transparent. We're hiring such, such and such to do the marketing for this particular program, mm -hmm. and, it, and that's where the narrative come in. It'll be like $75 an hour for 30 hours. So just it's, it's allowable. And honestly, they want to fund your program. Mm -hmm. They don't want to fund staff because for whatever reason, we're not respected for nonprofits. That's not one editorial. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not looked the same. We go, even though we go to college, you get these degrees, it's not looked upon as if we were in a for-profit. But people want to fund a program, so if you can outsource some of that, they, they look at that as a plus. Yeah, I just wanted to add, we've had some of the simple, so I'm trying to listen with this man community of Florida. We've had similar challenges with the marketing expenses, mm -hmm. um, and we're allocating those marketing dollars in our program budgets. The reality is, and you can call it what you want, you have to do outreach to your prospective clients. Mm -hmm. And grantors and funders, they, they will get that. So if you have to call it another name, put your marketing dollars in that program budget, you've got to do outreach to the clients. And that's what it is. So the marketing, you assign it to the program. Like specifically, if it's for, I think your marketing microphone check it's not okay is that working okay all right Whoa. we're there so um if you are like we were marketing an event um and it was interesting when i came out i'm like what is this uh the budget was really it's kind of like all over the place there were t-shirts that were purchased that weren't assigned anywhere but they were for specific programs and i'm like well this should be a cost for this particular program and there was marketing materials that were created, and like, I'm like, all those things should be assigned to the specific program. Um, and if it's for an organization like something that's overarching, then it should be part of the overarching organization budget. But yeah. subcontracting. Um, this for like new nonprofits is a great way to get grant funding. You want to partner with bigger organizations that can help you push your work forward. Um, I was, for many, many years, um, a subcontractor for the Department of Justice and the um, City of Omaha Mayor's Office because I was one of the only organizations doing gang intervention and prevention work. And so when the federal dollars, like that big grant, came down to the state level, um, that funding had to go out. The city was the overarching, they were in charge of the full grant. They had me doing the grant intervention and prevention. They had Urban League doing the college prep and tours. They had um, Heartland do like the medical um, and mental health. So you have these subcontractors that have their own niche, but they can serve lots and lots of people in the community, and that's, it's, yeah, we're good, we're good. Okay, I'll just try to talk louder. But with the subcontractors, you are able to, it's easier to, to write the grant, because you're literally writing maybe two or three paragraphs about who you are. That's it. And then you're writing your small little part of the budget and you're handing it over to the big organization that's going to lead the whole project. And then they put it all together. Um, yes? When it comes to funding staff, so I'm with uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Miami and our cost on program is 
comprised of youth assessment volunteer interviews, and so it's staff or program specialists who do that work. And I've, I mean, I'm the greatest developer. I, this is what I do all day, every day, and I come across a lot of resistance. And so, like the budget line item is salaries and benefits, but the activity that's being done is the program implementation. So how do you reconcile that? I tricked them. No. <laughs> I just, so there's a so this is what frustrates me with um, with foundations and philanthropists. Truly, they believe that because you're working for a nonprofit agency, you should work for free, and you should do it out of the kindness of your heart. And just forget those student loans you have. Don't worry about that. Um, but. It, it costs money to, to fund these programs, and I, I do have a slide on that towards the end. But what you can do is you assign the staff time, and you're probably doing this already, when it says salaries and benefits, you're assigning that particular staff time to each program. And because it's not sexy for people, I literally put program facilitators, which sounds better than salaries, and then in the narrative, I say, this goes to pay the salaries of the program facilitators. So you're being transparent, but it's just getting them to shift their minds. Someone has to implement this program. Like, you can't just let the kids mentor themselves. Like, there's things that happen. And so it's, it's how you frame it. Use different words like program facilitators. You can use um, even time, like if, if I go out as the ED and I do something, a portion of my salary and my time should be allocated to that program. So. What was the other one you used for salary? Uh, program facilitators. Program yeah. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, match. So let's talk about match real quick. Match is really important. A lot of grants will require you to have a match, and usually those are the big, big grants. So if they're going to give you $100,000, the requirement is that you match and raise $100,000, and it can either be in cash or in kind, right? So the guy that I'm writing grants for, because I am giving him a reduced rate, he's been a friend for years. That is, he can put that towards the in kind on his budget. Um, it makes me insane when people don't use in kind on their budgets. All the stuff you're getting in, if someone's donating like equipment to you and you use it, put that on your budget as in kind. If people are giving you their time, like free accounting, free marketing, put that on your budget. It makes for a stronger budget and it's re it's more realistic because it's saying right now we have this in kind, but if they don't give us, we're going to need money for that later. So just keep that in mind. Um, and for cash, sometimes the requirement for the match funding is that you have 25% or less to match whatever they're going to give you. Or it could be dollar for dollar. If I give you 100000 you need to raise 100000 And it's sometimes the requirement is that it, it be new money. Like you can't, if you already have 100000 you have to go raise another 100000 You can't use what you already have. So, so that's... How often do you, I mean, to me, that's like scary to be, as a developer person, like, okay, great, you gave me this gift, but there's such a big requirement. Like, do you, what do you find the value of those matching grants are in a way? I don't like them. Yeah. I don't like them because I, I feel like if you are going to support a cause or a mission, there should be stipulations like that attached mm -hmm. to it. Um, especially <coughs> with the current climate, um, the way the taxes are and people are, aren't giving them. So if you can avoid doing a match, you should. But if you're writing a federal grant and it requires a match, then you absolutely should do it. Because there, and I'll get to that in a second, there are other ways to match. If it's a federal grant, you can match a staff salary, something that you already have money for with whatever they're giving you. And I do that quite a bit. So whatever you're already spending costs on, right. you kind of cover your own. Yeah, so for the federal grants that I received, I would match, um, I would have funding uh, unrestricted to pay my staff salaries. Part of it is that you have to track literally every dollar that you spend for a match. So when I'm doing my report at the end of the year, I submit payroll records for the staff that are allocated to that program. And you literally just print it off and say, here's the 50000 in staff salaries that were the match to the 50000 that they paid. <coughs> Cash match, we can go past that. In kind, we talked about that. Sorry, I'm trying to get through. Not a good match. Let's <laughs> Things that aren't a good match. It's not a good match to use volunteer mileage, which is something that people do. And I'm like, why are you, you can't really do that. And it's, it's just not something that you want to do. People try to use, they'll get grant funding from a federal grant. They'll try to use that funding to match another federal grant. So that's basically taking my money to use it as a match for more money than I'm going to give you. And that you can't do that. It's not allowable. So just make sure that you're reading 
um, the stipulations with those um, match grants when you're applying for. Overhead and administrative costs, this is what it is for the past. Indirect costs. So indirect costs are the things that are not appealing to funders like maintenance and things like that that they don't want to pay for, administrative support. Um, but it's very important. It's what keeps the doors open. Um, you have to tell a different story and a narrative about why this is important and why it, why it should be funded. Um, the myth about it is that like the overhead refers to like the mission and not actually the money that you spend for actual overhead. So our, this is the page where I'm saying we really need to educate the donors about what, what we need from them and how their money is important to us. So a lot of times for years it's been that they wanted your administrative costs to be 10% um, of your overall budget, which is not feasible. That's not even real. And so a lot of conversations have been had over the last probably 10 years and it's shifting where donors are understanding that it costs a lot to run a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And nonprofits truly are like for-profit organizations. Um, and if you run your nonprofit like a for-profit, which is what I did, you will make a lot more money because you're thinking of creative ways to get new revenue streams. You can do train the trainers where you're going out for national programs like Bridges to Success or Bridges Out of Poverty. And then you can train other nonprofits. Like you can create revenue streams for your nonprofit. We'll go past that. This is the budget narrative. So I'm just going to hit this real quick. When you're writing the budget narrative at the end, make sure that you are clearly saying this is where the money's going because they're not going to remember what was on page five when they're on page 60. Final thoughts. Yay, we're coming to the end. <laughs> uh, so, nonprofits, I feel like you always have to demonstrate transparency and accountability. Um, I was really bothered working with that museum when they did, they received all that funding and they didn't use it for the kids programs that I said that they would be doing um, because they made me a liar and it made me mad. Uh, so, just be really transparent in what you're doing. Um, a lot of these foundations, they have more respect for you when you're honest, when you say, hey, this is going to be a fail because I can't do this part of this program. I had a program that was funded. Someone gave me $25,000 to do a community garden with some gang members I was working with. Um, so they were supervised by another lady who had not been around African-American boys. Um, and she said some things that were just racist, we're being honest, and I was like, and we're done. Um, thank you for your services. And I took the check and I wrote a check and gave it back to the foundation for $25,000. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't really need this. You can have it. Like, we don't want to work with her. They gave me $50,000. <coughs> wow. They're like, yeah. keep the check and find the person you want. This wow. is okay. So just be transparent yeah. with them. And like, these are the challenges that we have. And they, they will help you. Um, the other thing is, People hate to list their funders. I don't know why. It's like, no one's going to steal your funders. We all know who they are. Anyway. Clear your whatever. Um, right. But list your funders. And, and then right. even if it's an anonymous funder, if someone gives you an anonymous donation, when you're applying for the grant, list it out. Um, the Olsen, well, no, not a, no, no, no. Oh. List it, like literally list it. So the Olson Foundation, they fund a lot of projects that I do. I always list out Olson Foundation because they give a significant amount of money. And then I put this, and then you just, yes, yes. Because what you do is you say, this is an anonymous donation, but you're being transparent that they actually fund you. You would never like put that in a newsletter, but when you're applying for the grants, you want to share that. So the other thing is it gives you validity. If they know that, like the Olsen Foundation, Sherwood Foundation, the Florida Panthers, like when they know you're getting funding from these sources, it gives you validity as a, an organization in the program. Yeah. I have a kind of general question. So <clears throat> I've, I don't know if this is like me only or just where I've seen the a kind of pressure to take grants that either require you to create a new program or to increase some of the outcomes of your program. And so like, I, whereas again, we're all trying to fill buckets we already need. And so I'm just curious, especially since you've been on the reviewing end of what your thoughts are when you see grants that come in like, sure, we're going to double our outcomes versus no, seriously, we just need money for this because we're already doing the work. I'm going to tell you what people think when, when you're on the uh, the grant review committee and you see that, you're like, they are literally doing a cash grab. They can't pull this off because we know who their staff, like we know you, we know who's on your, we know who you are, mm -hmm. we know who's on your board, we know who's doing the program. We know that you can't increase services to 200 more kids when you only have five staff. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. You should, that truly is mission driven. 
you were just, and it's a lot, like when ACES came out, people were like, oh, we do ACES, what is it? Tell me, and you can't even <laughs> tell me, tell me what the questions are on the ACES assessment. No one can tell you. There's a lot of research behind ACEs, and everybody jumped on that bandwagon. I'm like, you don't do trauma. You don't do this. Although we and, actually do. <laughs> well, well, there are people that do. <laughs> Sorry, I love our No, but there are people that do it, and they know that it's aggregated. <laughs> it's over years yeah. that yeah. you're tracking this information. Yeah. You can't just start this today. Oh, I've been doing ACEs. No, you haven't. Yeah. And so you have to be transparent. You don't want to create a program just to get money. <coughs> All you're doing is creating a new problem. So now you have a new program that you have to add to the programs you're already trying to do. And the same with like increasing numbers too, right? So it's I like worked for a nonprofit. I took a job like a fool um, for a nonprofit without looking under the hood. I believe mm -hmm. the information that they gave me. They told me that they had this amazing transitional living program for young mothers, and I'm like, cool, that's amazing. And then I met the grant administrator by accident in, at a Department of Justice meeting in Atlanta. And she, her first words to me, I'm like, hi, I'm with this organization. I'm the new ED. She said, oh, you're the scapegoat. And I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> like, no. and she told me, she said, did they tell you they're under federal investigation? Oh. And they were under federal investigation because they had gotten $900,000 for a transitional living program to go over five years. They put one person in housing for five wow. years. Wow. And it was because it was a new thing, transitional living, transitional living, we're gonna do this. They had a <coughs> but they didn't know how to execute. <coughs> wow. So I was like, bye. Yeah. Real. Um, but just, yeah, don't do that. Like it's mission driven. You need to find people that are gonna support what you do or partner with another organization. Mm -hmm. And then that could be your new program. You're partnering with someone that already does it. Mm -hmm. Uh, these are key components to having a great grant. You have to tell a really good story. Um, and the story, sometimes you think it's a good story, but the rest of the world doesn't think it's a good story. So just know your audience when you're telling people um, things, even if it's just a presentation. But make sure you're telling a, a good story and that it's, it's factual, that you're not just making stuff up to make it seem like you're doing all these amazing things and you're not. Um, make sure that it's evidence-based and that you're using evidence-based models or best practice models. So my organization that I founded was a gang intervention and prevention in Omaha, and it was the model that we used was Ceasefire of Chicago, which is now Cure Violence. It's an evidence-based model. It's been proven to work, mm -hmm. and it worked for me, I'll tell you. So use something that's evidence-based. Make sure you have measurable outcomes. Measurable outcomes are not, oh, I'm fully staffed. If you give me money, I can be fully staffed. That's not <coughs> a measurable outcome. So make sure, that, make sure that your budgets don't have any funny math on it. If you have 10 programs, they all have 10 different budgets, those budgets should be reflected in the line item for your organizational budget. Um, and then have somebody read your final draft. I make this mistake often because I'm here by myself in Florida. I just moved here a year ago. Um, and I just, I just don't have people read my stuff. And I'm like, I'm burning the candle. It's like 3 in the morning, I'm writing the grant. I go back and I'm like, oh my God, I like misspelled words, things like that. So never hit send. If you don't have somebody to review it, you wait till you're fully rested and then review that. And then just make sure that you keep, keep it really simple and that you tell the truth. A lot of times people want to complicate. Someone was saying earlier that you talk too much and then you're telling all these things like you're giving away. <coughs> that are going to you know, cause pause. Just make sure you keep it simple and that you're always telling the truth. And these are resources that you can use. So for local... Local grants you want to go to um, community foundations, especially if you're a startup, United Way, um, Family Foundation, um, corporations, and then local corporations that have local facilities. Like Google moved to the Midwest, they were in Iowa, so they started doing all these fun, like I wrote a grant for them last year, um, they're doing some stuff in Nebraska and Iowa around technology for girls. So just make sure you're keeping, keeping up with like the big companies that are coming in. That's their social responsibility, but not so much. Um, federal grants, you can go to grants.gov. Um, they list literally every grant that's offered. Um, but make sure you read the RFP before you start writing it, because there are things that aren't allowable. And if you get to page 30, and you're like, damn it. You'll have to, you know, just make sure that what you're doing actually works. And then make sure you're using facts for your demographics. So if you're writing a program, um, a, a grant for something in Miami, make sure you're going to like the census. Uh, fact finder to get actual statistics for Miami. Um, I hate when I read a grant proposal like someone's trying to get money and then it's 
oh, we do all this work in Iowa. And I'm like, that's great, but we're looking for Nebraska. You know, so just make sure you're using like data and statistics for the area that you're serving. Um, and then evaluation is really, really important. Um, it's hard, so people don't like to measure outcomes and go through all that. You need an evaluation tool to um, measure your outcomes. So you can go to the Kellogg Foundation. They have this cool um, resource so that they can help you create a logic model. You can also go to the um, National Science Foundation because they have a uh, project evaluation outline and it tells you how to do that. Yes, back to one thing you talked about, the logic model, where can you find that? Um, the Kellogg Foundation. Okay. And it's on, it's on that page, it's really tiny. But I, literally, I can email this out to you if you want. It's but like Candace, it's like Candace. Candace. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. But it, it just shows you like the steps to creating a decent logic model so that when you apply it to your different programs. <coughs> Any questions? That's me. <laughs> yes. A two-part question. Dealing with tracking and reports. One, is, have you noticed a trend of funders requiring more tracking data and more yep. specific information on outcomes? Yeah. So all of the major funders, like the big foundations, they they. They want to, like when you say, I use this evidence-based model, they will meet with you and say, how do you use it? How is it implemented in your program? And if you start stuttering, they will pull the funding. Um, one of the person that I know who has done, um, she, did, she did therapy for years, so over 20 years, she had received over a million dollars from this particular foundation, which one of my friends, she runs the foundation. She's like, I kept telling her she needed to change her model. She, she has the same old business model she's been using for the last 20 years. Um, and sh this person said, hey, why don't you partner with this other organization so that you'll have stronger therapy programs because they have housing and all this other stuff. She wouldn't do it. And she, when you don't adjust and adapt, then you die. And so now she has no funding. She literally has no funding because this big funder pulled out. They talked to another funder. That funder pulled out. And so it's, you have to really make sure that your outcomes are true, measurable outcomes that you can deliver on. And if you can deliver on them, call them and say, hey, we're having trouble here, so we might want to shift and do this instead. Other questions? Great. Working with a donor. Just, yeah. just a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. It's almost like your elevator speech, right? I mean, and should we do it in a way where we're just meeting them? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they don't know anything about your organization. <laughs> <laughs> you know, students, I want you to hear what your organization is saying about this. So, so try to pitch somebody that does have a capital that pitch somebody you don't know doesn't know you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I'm winning. Without a winner? <laughs> no, you didn't hear that. I don't, I don't want to All right, guys, I want you to have full opportunity to continue talking if you need, if you want to. Uh, two things are going to happen. One, we're gonna, we have some more raffles to give out. It's okay. And then two, the students, we will be meeting downstairs at 12.30 for our student meeting. Okay, so Karen Prescott, the bow tie girl, has kindly donated three unique handmade bow ties with uh, accompanying pocket squares, correct? So we will wrap them all off individually. The first one we will do is this nice uh, black, ooh, black and white stripe with a polka dot uh, pocket square. So drum roll, please. Really loud for us. You don't have a microphone. <laughs> All right. One one nine two five one. Oh. <laughs> 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 Pink bow tie oh, with the oh, pink and black oh, dragon pocket square. Oh, I want Drum roll, please. All right. Where are you? Oh, I'm the one, one, nine, two, six, one. Pink! Yes! Last but not least, we have this black, like, satin bedazzled. One one nine two six three. She can't tell you, see, right? Yes. Hey, I'll call you. Can you guys come over there with a picture? I love it. I love it. <laughs> How's your family back in the back of the day?